It's the most secret military base on the planet. You wanted Area 51, there it is. But no one's ever been this close, until now. This is the place to be at the right time. What is the government hiding inside? Is it secret weapons or extraterrestrial technology? We're taking it apart to figure out how it works. And what happens when people venture too far? We actually had to jump into the car to protect ourselves. Now, declassified information, inside accounts, revelations from former CIA pilots. I saw a flying saucer. And a groundbreaking look at the base with state-of-the-art equipment. We're getting images of Area 51 in high definition, the likes of which people have never seen before. This is case number 55101, Area 51 revealed. It's huge. October 2008. Pat Uskert is in the remote Nevada desert, 15 miles from Area 51. Is that them? It's definitely them. What are they doing? They're watching us. There's two guys in there. You want to see? You see, there are two guys actually in yes. the vehicle? Did their lights just turn on? Yes, it did. August 1955, the same Nevada desert. On a desolate dry lake bed, a plane unlike any seen before blasts into the air. This test of the U-2 spy plane ushers in the modern age of top secret aircraft. And the center of it all is Groom Lake, also known as Area 51. Chosen by the US government for its remote, almost impossible to reach location. No public road comes closer than 15 miles. The nearest town, Rachel, isn't established until 1973, and its population is rarely more than two to 300 people. For over 30 years, this isolated base in the middle of the desert is shrouded in mystery. Reports of strange lights hovering over the base become regular, and radar captures impossibly fast objects moving in the vicinity. But secrecy remains. Then, in 1989, everything changes. The time where I entered the hangar, I witnessed a uh, recovered alien spacecraft that uh, the Department of Naval Intelligence in the United States was back engineering. Alleged U.S. government physicist Bob Lazar goes public and claims he is reverse engineering alien spacecraft at Area 51. UFO sightings in the airspace above Groom Lake skyrocket. But the base remains closed off. An outer perimeter of at least 15 miles prevents anyone from seeing the installation. People who try to cross the perimeter are chased off, face arrest, and are warned that deadly force for trespassers is authorized. But now, using new high-definition cameras, there may be a way in. We're only a few miles away from the beating heart central of Area 51. It's almost a nation unto itself, with its own staff, uh, personnel, its own resources. Programs are actually ongoing today with, with new vehicles that we don't even know about yet. Today, the U.S. government has not officially acknowledged the existence of a base called Area 51, let alone admitted to extraterrestrial experimentation. The investigation now comes to the remote desert of Nevada for answers. Dr. Ted Ackworth will explore the official military history of the base. There has been a progression of the most advanced, the most clandestine vehicles developed here over the last 40 years. Bill Burns will look into the allegations of reverse engineering. 
the more we get into this story, the bigger and the deeper it gets. And Pat Uskert will attempt to see the base itself. Here's a chance to have a look into one of the most secret places in the world. Area 51 gets its name from 1950s era maps. They show the Nevada test site complex divided into a grid with a different number assigned for each separate quadrant. The land around Groom Lake just happens to be assigned the number 51. With little to no important details from these historical records, only a select number of people have gotten closer to the truth about what's happening inside. I'm about to meet with Peter Merlin. He's an aeronautical historian and something of an expert on Area 51. Peter Merlin is a member of the Nevada Test Site Historical Foundation. He has interviewed dozens of Area 51 employees and has studied some of the top secret bases declassified documents and formerly illegal satellite images. Now the base was first opened around 1955, is that right? It was established in 1955 by the Central Intelligence Agency. The U-2 spy plan was highly classified and they needed a place to test it outside of the public eye. Engineers initially choose Groom Lake, an enormous dry lake bed, because of the possibility for a 20,000 foot natural runway. But when it becomes apparent the U-2 would be vulnerable to Soviet missile attack, the U.S. military begins ramping up other secret projects. Well, the base of Groom Lake just wasn't ready for that. Uh, didn't have the facilities, the infrastructure, or the runway. So they built it up, and that's how it became a full-scale Air Force base that we know today. By the 1960s, the base becomes ground zero for the development and testing of many top-secret military aircraft. The RB-69A, the F-117, and the B-2. What do you think they're working on in Area 51 now? Uh, we're going to probably see a lot more testing of unmanned vehicles now because there's been a big push in the Air Force uh, in that direction. But seeing a test in this highly restricted area is almost unheard of. Yet this is precisely what Pat is about to attempt. Pat is meeting with Mark Farmer, an aerial combat cameraman and Area 51 expert. He is taking Pat to view an undisclosed flight path that few have ever been to. We're about 20 miles to the north of Area 51. This whole place is contaminated with plutonium. Uh, they had done a weapons dispersal test where they blew up a nuclear weapon. So are we in a plutonium enriched area right now? There's plutonium around. <laughs> OK, great. According to Farmer, many years have passed since the last weapons test. But this area has become a prime location for something else, observing flight tests. Boy, I hear something right now. Sounds like we got something coming in. In the distance, an F-15 moves through the skies over Area 51. Not long after, it's joined by another. The military may have been alerted to the investigation's presence. Do you think we are, we are being watched? And certainly electronically surveilled. An unknown number of sensors that collect visual and audio data are scattered all across this area of the desert. How would they be monitoring us? A school of techniques called electronic support measures, which basically are sucking up just electromagnetic emanations. And we have wireless microphones on right now. Uh, we have cell phones. We have walkie-talkies. Uh, we've been blasting out all sorts of stuff. So it's very easy for them to pick up. The F-15s make a couple of passes, but soon disappear from sight no further activity takes place. With the base most likely aware of their presence, Mark and Pat realize they're not going to see any further flights. It's their job to keep that place secret, so of course they're gonna do what they gotta do. No one knows this better than Bob Lazar, who after years of ridicule, drops out of the public eye. 
But the man who originally broke the story, George Knapp, is still pursuing the facts. Knapp currently works for KLAS-TV, the CBS affiliate in Las Vegas, Nevada. George Knapp broke the Bob Lazar story. George Knapp broke the Area 51 story. In Knapp's report from November 1989, Lazar claims to be reverse engineering extraterrestrial flying saucers at a place called S-4 in the Area 51 complex. But proof of Lazar's employment at S-4 and at Los Alamos National Laboratory, where he reportedly worked prior to Area 51, seems to disappear. He claims his identity is being erased. And many dismiss him as a fraud. But Knapp finds something shocking in the Los Alamos lab records. We called the lab, they said, no, he wasn't here. We don't have any record of him. And then we found the lab phone book with his name in it. I call him back, I said, well, there it is. Ah, well, we still don't have any records. Was the government trying to hide that Lazar had ever been working at Area 51? So then we, I, I got the uh, newspaper article, Los Alamos Monitor. There he is on the front page, and a, a picture of him with his jet car, and it lists him as a physicist. I went back to the lab. Nah, we don't have anything for him. And I know he was there, not only because of the, the phone book and the newspaper article, but because I've interviewed four or five people who worked with him there who said he was there working on classified projects. With strong proof that Lazar worked at Los Alamos, Knapp believes there's credence to his claims. But one of the most bizarre is yet to come. Lazar also divulged to Knapp that while working at Area 51, he came into contact with a powerful alien energy source he called Element 115. He has speculated that it came from some other planet or, or some other solar system, and we're taking it apart to figure out how it works. Lazar claims element 115 is used to power flying saucers. The key for me was always, did he work at Los Alamos lab? Because if he was working there in a classified position in scientific and technical job ca capabilities, then it's at least conceivable he could have worked at a place called Area 51. Do you believe Bob Lazar's story? I do. Now, a former CIA pilot is about to confirm Lazar's story and steps forward with a shocking sighting of his own. Just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government extraterrestrial UFOs. In 1989, alleged government physicist Bob Lazar tells the world he's been reverse engineering extraterrestrial flying saucers at Area 51. Lazar also claims the flying saucers he worked on are powered by a strange alien energy source called Element 115. But the secrecy surrounding the base keeps anyone from verifying these claims. Stories of elite security forces keeping the curious away begin to surface. And Pat is about to see just how intimidating these defenses really are. I'm about to meet with author Susan Wright, who wrote a book about Area 51. Now, she had a very scary experience just outside the perimeter of Area 51. Pat and Susan are driving 125 miles north from Las Vegas. They're now at the intersection of Highway 375 and a dirt road that leads directly into the base at Groom Lake. So what road are we on? This is the Groom Lake Road, and this actually goes to the front entrance of Area 51. The last time Susan was at the perimeter was in 1997. It was an experience she won't soon forget. The military really controls this area, and they try to be very intimidating to scare people away. So what did you experience? Well, when we went down this road, we went all the way to the border of Area 51, and we saw the camo dudes, Camo Dudes is the nickname given to Area 51 roving security guards who wear camouflaged uniforms. They were blocking the uh, road so we couldn't get in any further. And we pulled back to the next series of buttes. We got out of the car and uh, a helicopter just rose out of nowhere. It was like no sound, no warning. 
So suddenly the helicopter was boom, right there in front of us. Like how close? Like 40 feet away. We actually had to jump into the car to protect ourselves. It's very frightening, it's very intimidating, and obviously that's what they meant to do. They wanted to scare us away from the area. Why would a military base be engaging in scare tactics towards curious civilians? The answer could lie in what they're testing. As Susan and Pat continue driving toward Area 51, Bill is uncovering new information about the purported function of Element 115 from a man who Bob Lazar confided in. His name is John Lear. John's father invented the Learjet. John himself is an accomplished pilot. He worked for the CIA, he had a very high security clearance. Lear retired with more than 19,000 hours of flight time. He holds the most FAA airman certificates ever earned by a single pilot. But his entire life changed when he developed a close personal friendship with Bob Lazar back in the late 1980s. According to Lear, Lazar used to take him on late night excursions to the outskirts of Area 51 to watch flying saucer tests. You saw a flying saucer at Area no 51. No doubt about it. I saw a flying saucer. It was radiating yellow and gold. Bob Lazar told me when it was going to be there, and it was there. In never before seen home video from March 22, 1989, John Lear is shown here on the perimeter of Area 51, also referred to as Groom Lake. The voice of the man holding the camera is Bob Lazar. We're standing just about uh, eight miles due east of Groom Lake, Nevada, the super government uh, secret test site. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs fly over there. Uh, we all watched it for about uh, <clears throat> seven or eight minutes. The mission was organized tonight uh, by Bob Lazar, who is a, uh, a, um, a theoretical physicist who works at Groom Lake. <laughs> <laughs> and is also a dead man at this point. <laughs> Lear also claims Lazar gave him detailed accounts of the work he was doing. He was trying to back engineer the exact actual engine that propelled this craft hundreds of thousands of light years away. Lear references a model of a reactor, which he claims is the key to the flying saucer's energy source. You take the cap off here and the fuel that propels this thing is a piece of element 115. Bob said that we have 500 pounds of this stuff at Los Alamos. They shoot protons into the tip of that element 115 right there. Yeah. And what it does is it bumps it up to 116 mm -hmm. and it instantaneously decays. The number 115 represents how many protons are in the element's atomic nucleus. Lazar claims bombarding element 115 with additional protons raises the number to 116. But the new creation is unstable and quickly breaks apart, releasing enormous amounts of energy. The entire process, according to Lazar, enables flying saucers to break conventional laws of gravity and travel at incredible speeds. Here is our saucer here is space. What they can do is pull space towards them and wrap it around the craft. That's what enables them to travel through space at, you know, hundreds of light years. While most scientists dispute Lazar's claims about the physics of element 115, John Lear and Bob Lazar contend that it's only beginning to be understood. For anybody who thinks that flying saucers are a myth, a delusion, a hoax. John confirmed everything. John was deeper inside than anybody has ever been, except for Bob Lazar. The activities inside Area 51 may be out of view, but at the perimeter, the operation is all too public. Pat and Susan are now at the northeast corner of the restricted area. When they notice, they are not alone. There you go, right there. Why, 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 Camo why? dudes on that hill. Why? 
Is that them? It's definitely them. What are they doing? They're watching us. There's two guys in there. You want to see? You see, there are two guys actually in yes. the vehicle? Did their lights just turn on? Yes, it did. I was wondering if there was anyone in the car. Right. And they sort of turn on their lights to respond to that. In the distance, surveillance units are monitoring both video and audio in the area. And see, you can see the sensors right there, right there, keeping an eye on us. Despite being tracked, Pat and Susan continue on to the perimeter. You can see there's a new sign they've put over the old one. The old signs had, violators will be shot, which really? was a little intense. Wow. And so now they've got these signs. Well, what's this one say? Warning, U.S. Air Force installation. It is unlawful to enter this area without permission of the installation commander. All personnel and the property under their control are subject to search. Wow. As Pat and Susan begin walking along the orange posts outlining the border, security always maintains a constant line of sight. Well, they reposition themselves so they can see better exactly what we're doing. They want to see where we're going to go and what exactly we're going to do. They're watching us right now. Yeah, they probably have binoculars trained on us right now. I'd like to get out of here. OK. Can we go? We can go. After seeing the tight security up close, Pat tackles a new vantage point. But this one involves a treacherous hike up a steep 8,000-foot peak that will finally reveal Area 51. We're getting images of Area 51 in high definition, the likes of which people have never seen before. Twenty-two miles off-road from the nearest town, Pat is meeting with experienced Area 51 guide Glenn Campbell, and the two will hike up to a vantage point named Tickaboo Peak. From the top, they'll be able to see the base with their own eyes. We're about to set up our day camp because we're here a little early. The sun is still out, and we want to do this hike at night. We want to be there at sunrise. That's the, the prime time to see Area 51 in the morning when the sun is coming up. While Pat and Glenn Campbell set up a base camp for the night, 20 miles away, Dr. Ted Ackworth is surveying the skies over Groom Lake. Midway between the Nevada towns of Rachel and Alamo sits a stretch of road where UFOs are frequently reported in the airspace above Area 51. These actual images from over the clandestine base were captured here by amateur videographers. To put this to the test, we've actually contracted with a surveillance company out of Las Vegas, Southwest Surveillance. They're bringing in three high-resolution video cameras, which we will orient towards Area 51 and see if we capture anything on tape. The three cameras are set up 100 feet apart and will continuously record a panoramic portion of the skies above Area 51 for the next three days. If there's any strange aerial activity over the base, day or night, these cameras will capture it. As nightfall comes, Pat and Glenn Campbell are preparing for the long hike to the top of Tickaboo Peak. Tickaboo Peak is 26 miles away from Area 51 and is the only current location to legally view the base. We had to come across 22 miles of dirt road to get here. We have to hike uh, this very difficult hike up to the top of the peak. So it's not something that people are going to do every day. It's half past midnight. I'm here at the base of Tickaboo Peak at about uh, 6,900 feet. Uh, the air is very dry, and uh, I'm already feeling the altitude a little bit. Though the hike is only a mile in distance, it requires a 1,000-foot ascent over steep and treacherous terrain. 
Pat and Glenn must often crawl on their hands and knees through scree, a combination of loose rock and dirt. We've been uh, hiking for a while now. The, the incline is, is steep at a certain point, so this is not easy. Uh, for those who are attempting this, you know, you have to be an experienced climber. This is not for, for beginners. Uh, you could easily fall to your death here. The night hike takes Pat and Glenn nearly three hours. Are we almost there? We're just about there, over the next ridge here. As they cross the ridge, the most elusive base in the world comes into view. You wanted Area 51. There it is. Oh my gosh. It's huge. The base is still 26 miles away. But the stillness of the Nevada desert air and the lack of humidity gives a clear view. As the sun comes up, we'll begin to see more detail, but each of those uh, lights generally corresponds to a hangar. Uh, it's a pretty spread out area. The base itself is several miles long. Long now, what, what, what exactly is seven miles long? The lights we're, we're looking at there, or? or well, it all, all, depend, all depends upon how you measure it. The, the actual block of land that we know of as Area 51 is about 10 miles by 6 miles. Uh, so the, that block isn't terribly big, but it's surrounded by all this buffer of military land. So it's really a vast area. This, this whole military complex is about the size of the state of Connecticut and the state of Rhode Island combined. So it's huge. As the sun begins to rise, these close-up, high-definition views of the most secret base in U.S. history are a television first. But as Pat peers into the base, another mystery appears overhead. Unmarked jets. These flights are rumored to transport workers into Area 51, and their jobs at Area 51 are unknown. I see a plane coming in. Does it have that red stripe down the side? It looks like it. White with a red stripe down the windows. That's the one. It's bringing the workers in. The workers all come up from Las Vegas and, and fly on those 737 jets. It's like a scheduled airline. They come in on a regular basis. This early in the morning, they're going to be coming in every half hour. But the light of daybreak is now giving extremely clear views. The best look at Area 51 ever possible. Taking these images requires equipment beyond the scope of a normal film shoot. As you can see, we have a very special camera here. Your normal average camera has a 50 millimeter lens, but we've acquired a camera here that has a lens that's 1140 millimeters, allowing us to get unprecedented images of Area 51. This camera's high definition, and Glenn Campbell tells me that there's never been a camera up here of this quality and of this magnification. So we're getting images of Area 51 in high definition, the likes of which people have never seen before. The camera reveals a giant runway and a string of buildings that make up the bulk of Area 51. These inconspicuously positioned hangars, offices, and airstrips in the middle of the Nevada desert are an enigma. But the biggest mystery of all is this giant hangar, which has only recently been constructed. I've run out of adjectives. I can say amazing, fantastic, uh, incredible, but it, they all don't seem to encapsulate the experience. Uh, I mean, for someone investigating UFOs, uh, this is the place to be at the right time. What is happening inside the massive hangar, clearly visible from the top of Tikaboo Peak? The most current satellite imagery of the base reveals the cutting edge possibilities. And this big one is really unusual.
Ted turns to the most current satellite imagery of the base with aeronautical historian Peter Merlin. This is the most recent picture we have taken by a satellite of Area 51. It looks like a really, really high quality photo. Today, Area 51 consists of 24 hangars, four runways, numerous dormitories, a radar tower, and even an explosion-proof building. But it didn't start out this expansive. This is how it looked in the 1950s, when it was called Watertown Airstrip. It was just a simple 5,000-foot asphalt runway, several little hangars, a couple warehouses, some trailers for people to live in, pretty spartan conditions. The base keeps this modest profile for the next 25 years. Then, it explodes. In the 1980s, there were some dramatic changes. We see a storage area for munitions. The runway has been extended 5,000 feet. They added a new taxiway. These changes during the 80s happened just before Bob Lazar goes public, claiming the government is testing top secret aircraft based on alien technology. And now, the most recent satellite images are confirming what Pat saw at the top of Tickaboo Peak. There are some new hangars down on the south end, and you kind of wonder why they needed a new hangar, because they already had 23 hangars just about. I mean, these others must not be sitting empty. And this big one is really unusual. What would require a hangar this large? Previous investigations have seen alleged UFOs of many shapes and sizes, but only one type fits this description. The sightings of giant triangles. In 1997, in Phoenix, Arizona. I saw a large a delta shaped dark object. In 2004, in Tinley Park, Illinois. I got it on tape! I got it! And as recently as 2008, in Wales, in the United Kingdom. I looked straight into the sky and I saw these strange triangular formations. A possible military explanation, the stealth blimp has been raised, but the government denies its existence, and many experts ask how it could be hidden from the public. Disinformation, misinformation program, that's how we keep things secret. They may never be revealed. But the investigation may have just found its answer inside Area 51. Is this hangar proof of an emerging top secret technology responsible for UFO sightings over the past decade? The only way to get this answer is to speak with Area 51 employees. As Glenn Campbell pointed out at the top of Tickaboo Peak, most Area 51 employees are transported to the base in white unmarked airplanes, bearing a red stripe down the side. Research by Campbell and others has revealed they are called Janet flights, and they depart daily from McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas. Pat and Glenn are attempting to track these anonymous Janet flights from the ground while Bill and Mark Farmer are observing the Janet flights from the 18th floor of the Tropicana Hotel, one of the only locations in Las Vegas that provides an actual view of the Janet flight terminal. Mark is gonna track the numbers of the flights that we think are Janet flights. Then we're gonna run them on the FAA database and see who owns these planes. Circling the perimeter of McCarran International Airport, Pat and Glenn search for a line of sight. Now, what does Janet actually stand for? There's various acronyms. They could, it could be Joint Army Navy Transport is one possible acronym, but no one knows for sure what Janet means. It's just a call sign. These actual tower tapes from McCarran Airport confirm the use of the Janet call sign. Las Vegas Post Janet 721. Post Janet 210 15. So these are the same jets we saw from Tickaboo Peak. 
The same ones they left Las Vegas 20 minutes before, and then they're up at Area 51. So this is their daily commute. We're seeing the planes take off here. They land in Area 51. Every secret base has to have some connections to the outside world, and this is a major connection right here. Back in the hotel, Bill and Mark are tracking departing Janet flights and noting each plane's tail number. Okay, the one that's loading right now is November 5177 Charlie. Running Janet flight tail numbers on the Federal Aviation Administration's flight database website confirms the government's investment in the airline. 6662 uh, Bravo Alpha. It is registered to the United States government. So what's going on here? You were just driving around the airport and you looked over there, you wouldn't think anything of this facility. If you look a little closer, you see the barbed wire, you see the guard shack, you see that there's no markings on the building. It's hiding in plain sight is what it is. Getting Area 51 employees to speak publicly is nearly impossible. But Bill Burns has managed to track one down. The time we were out there, we were non-existent. I'm meeting with T.D. Barnes, a former engineer at Area 51. T.D. Barnes is employed at Area 51 from 1968 to 1972 as an electrical engineer. He's crucial in the development of numerous top secret aircraft that have since been declassified, like the A-12 and the F-117. According to him, the true identity of each and every Area 51 engineer is kept secret while working at the base. We did have pseudo names, I had code names. So the time we were out there, there's no really record. We were non-existent. Barnes's description may help validate the claims of Bob Lazar, who was never able to produce any form of proof he was ever employed at Area 51. And according to Barnes, Security was so tight, individual engineers weren't allowed access to projects other than their own. There was times when something would be going on outdoors that none of us needed to see, and we would go to the mess hall and they'd pull blackout curtains and we'd sit there for two or three hours. If any strange technology was being tested, if you weren't a part of the program, you didn't see it. What do you know about UFOs and reverse engineering taking place? None of us ever knew of any of that going on. I'm not saying it didn't happen. So it might have been feasible for some kind of reverse engineering project to be going on there. Is that, of course, you wouldn't know about? Wouldn't know about it. And, you know, anything like that would be possible. The possibility exists that they could have been flying some extraterrestrial spacecraft over the base, everybody's huddled in the mess hall, all the shades were drawn, you'd never see it. That's how compartmentalized and secret life was at Area 51. But are Lazar's claims of UFO test flights true? On the outskirts of Area 51, the three high-resolution surveillance cameras Ted set up are capturing some unexplained aerial phenomenon. The cameras were recording continuously for three days. And now, Ted and image analyst Terence Masson are taking a closer look at the footage. On the first night, at 10.39 p.m., this strange light is seen appearing in the middle of the night sky over Area 51 and descending quickly behind the mountains. For it to be that bright, I don't think it's lighting. I think it's got to be some sort of propulsion system or jet. Can we overlay the daylight shot that has the terrain and the mountains with the nighttime shot? Terence combines the two images and is surprised by what he finds. We can crossfade between the two of these and we can see that as this thing approaches the horizon just before it blinks out, it's actually a good bit above the horizon line, above the mountain line. So it's not getting cut off exactly uh, as it falls behind the, the, the ridge line. Whatever was captured on camera seems to be blinking off. 
where it ends up there is pretty close to the beginning of the approach for the runway to Area 51. Right. Well, let's see if we can get an estimate of the speed of that. Ted uses the known distance between the camera and Area 51, about 15 miles, as well as the height and distance to the mountains in the foreground to estimate the speed of the object. How much distance on the frame is the object falling compared to the height of the mountain range? It's roughly about twice the relative height of the mountain range off the ground. If it's dropping over Area 51, we're seeing it travel about 10,000 feet in about 2.2 seconds. That's about 3,600 miles per hour. That's pretty fast. That's pretty fast. <laughs> 3,600 miles per hour. This is faster than any of our aircraft. If it's further away than that, if it's beyond Area 51, say 20 or 30 more miles away, it's going at extremely high speeds that would only be consistent with a meteorite. This wouldn't be consistent, in my experience, with a meteorite, with this kind of visual data, right? Because it way would be going slow. way too slow. Yeah. Just, everybody's seen shooting stars, meteorites. It was just a whole frame a in a right fraction across of frame. a second. The only manned aircraft to travel at speeds of this magnitude was the X-15, which was able to break speeds over 4,500 miles per hour. But that aircraft's final flight was October 24, 1968. No publicly known aircraft has reported speeds like that since. It stumps us, so we're kind of left with a mystery. Something descended at high speed down into Area 51, and we're just not sure what it is. We've driven around this place. We've tried to look inside. What we have here is ultimate secrecy. Area 51 is fact. It's not fiction. It's been here since 1955. While the, the facility itself has never been secret, what happens in the facility has always been extremely top secret. After everything else is eliminated, what is the big secret of Area 51? Are the saucers still out there in those mountains? What are they hiding? What's there? The closest looks at Area 51 prove that the base is still active. And with massive hangars, impossibly fast objects, and recent sightings of large triangles all across the globe, Area 51 may be the source of a worldwide UFO phenomenon.